Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Edward Terensky, and I'm the Managing Principal of DTS. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program, A New Era in Doden Security, What C2C Brings to the Cyber Fight, hosted by Forescout. Comply to Connect is a framework that restricts unauthorized device access, reduces known vulnerabilities, takes actions to defect, identify, characterize, report, deter, anomalous behaviors, and maintains the secure configuration of the network and its information resources. C2C capabilities secure all endpoints connected to the DOTEN. Today, you heard directly from DOD leaders on how C2C is rolling out to make cybersecurity move effectively and efficiently. Joining me today are Captain David Tan, C2C Project Officer, United States Marine Corps, Carmen Santos Logan, Department of Defense. Throughout today's program, we are taking questions from the audience. Make sure to submit your questions via the tab on the right-hand side of your screen. So to start things off, we're gonna introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, Carmen is joining us via phone due to her busy DOD schedule. Uh, she is here. Um, so we'll start with Carmen with an introduction and then we'll move to Captain Tan. Carmen? Good morning, Ed, and good morning, audience. Thank you very much for allowing us to come on and talk about um, the Comply to Connect initiative for the Department of Defense. So I'm Carmen Santos Logan. I am a senior uh, cybersecurity analyst with the DO Department of Defense, DOD CIO. Uh, I'm responsible for the overall policy of the DOD Continuous Monitoring Program and the strategic implementation and high level planning for the Comply to Connect effort. Captain Tan. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Captain Tan here. I do work at Marine Corps Systems Command. That is the acquisition arm for the Marine Corps. Um, and if uh, I'll use a four-letter word, uh, ITIL, uh, if you're familiar with that, services transition is uh, really kind of my role here. Uh, and I do work hand very closely with the uh, Marine Corps Cyber Operations Group, which are the, the operators of the network. Uh, and I've been working on Comply to Connect, trying to get it fielded and operational for the past uh, about two and a half years. Great, thank you, sir. Um, to get us started, let's bring up the first slide and we'll start with Carmen. To give us uh, some background on C2C, uh, a little bit about the program, some key aspects of that program. Carmen? Sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, so if we could bring up the first slide, I believe that will serve as a good introduction for your audience today as to what is Comply to Connect overall. Um, and while that slide is coming up, um, I can probably do a little bit of explanation. So Comply to Connect is um, an overall cybersecurity framework of tools and technologies that are fused together through the concept of security product orchestration to deliver basically a unified cybersecurity platform um, for the department network. C2C overall fits into the overall schema of zero trust um, in that it is providing the device management piece for the zero trust um, strategy for the overall department. C2C is a five-year cybersecurity program, meaning that we are funded for certain aspects of the capability and be able to deliver that capability starting um, with last year's uh, FY20 uh, initiative. And we are funded out to 2024. And within the strategic implementation plan, there are numbers of expectations as we move the department through each of the steps um, or the functions of the C2C wheel. And um, overall, once all that activity is completed, our, our strategic tenants are basically to put into play as much of security automation that we can so that we can improve the overall posture of the department with respect to cyber hygiene. The, some of the strategic tenants that we've used to communicate how C2C will work is that it is supposed to take on some of the more tedious cybersecurity routine type activities. Um, things like managing configuration of the different devices, being able to discover where all the devices are, 
and then eventually being able through security automation automate um, basically the back end processes to check that the device is in the proper location to ensure its security posture has um, is acceptable enough, meaning that you are properly configured, those devices are properly configured and properly patched. And then with respect to being able to do um, continuous monitoring, to continually report the device security status. So I think in those very short terms, I've given you a high level um, description of what Comply to Connect uh, is for the Department of Defense. All right, uh, Captain Town, uh, you're implementing this at the Marine Corps. And as, as Carmen stated, it's to help uh, these, this will and this framework is set up more effective routine operations. Um, it's, to, it's to help you guys, you know, zero vulnerability, comply to connect, zero trust. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you guys are doing this uh, along with the framework and also what on the floor at the Marine Corps, how this is working? Uh, absolutely. Uh, happy to do that. Uh, we do have a couple different networks and they are managed distinct from each other. I'm sure that's probably the case for a lot of the folks that are listening. You have different networks. Uh, I'll give the example of we have the uh, community services network that runs all of the commissaries and exchanges uh, that are at the bases all around the world. We also have the recruiting command network, which is entirely separate, uses different transport, different domain, different management. And then, of course, we actually have our garrison network and then the classified network. So there's a lot of different systems that we have to roll this out on. Um, in, in each case, uh, we've used a very similar kind of architecture, uh, exactly as is recommended uh, uh, by Ms. Santos Logan and, and by the DISA program office as well. Uh, so that's been very useful to have that sort of uh, uh, plan out there. But really, the, the, the wheel that they give you, um, I, you can really just apply that in a very small scale. What we've done in a couple places is just within a lab environment or just within a regional headquarters where most of the users are IT savvy, we're able to deploy the system and then start to kind of move around that wheel uh, through the discovery phase particularly and then into uh, interrogation and all of that. Uh, and sort of prove that vertical slice, show that we're not going to do any damage, not going to uh, eat up the uh, 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 too much bandwidth or anything like that. Uh, and we can kind of prove it in these small scales and then expand. Um, so that's that's kind of been the, the method we've used to roll it out. All right, thank you. Uh, Carmen, you'd mentioned it uh, a bit from the funding perspective, but can you give me a little more information on the implementation timeline and what the DOD is expecting? from that? So Comply to Connect is a five-year funded program started in FY20. With that, um, the funds are basically going to be, uh, were given to DISA to deliver aspects of Comply to Connect as basically an enterprise. So in other words, DISA traditionally with all of our enterprise cybersecurity tools, are, they are basically responsible for the delivery of the licenses, the delivery of training, the delivery of some core enterprise um, integration services, and to also maintain the overall um, timeline, if you will, as to how people are successfully deploying. So there's, a, there's an expectation of also having um, a help desk function to continually answer uh, questions. So the funding, again, is, is enterprise provided within the, each of the components. Each component will be responsible for looking at how they would deliver Comply to Connect in their own network environment. And I, would, and I believe um, for the planning of Comply to Connect to understand what their switching fabric looks like, because what we're trying to do is to make sure that from a compatibility and interoperability standpoint, we have the right components have made investments, not only in the right infrastructure and the switching, but they have also have the, the latest and greatest. Um, you know, if we have something that is probably 10 years old, probably won't do well in a comply to connect environment. So we've cautioned and provided um, components opportunities to do self-assessment as part of their planning for the delivery of comply to connect. 
and fully understand which parts and pieces of their network might have to be upgraded. So they will bear that cost um, with respect to executing that self-assessment and then begin to interface with DISA on basically the acquisition or the, the um the delivery of the licenses to the components. And then DISA will also assist as part of their help desk function and integration services, begin to help components understand what they have to do from um, basically an implementation or deployment and implementation. Oh, thank you. So Kevin, Tom, with the, the implementation question still proceeding, um, I assume you guys are, are have done a self-assessment and you're moving forward. Can you talk a little bit about what the Marine Corps specifically um, is looking to accomplish in, in a timeline, if you can? Definitely. I will say we are a little ahead. Um, we had a couple key leaders well before I was involved with this project at all that, that really saw the need for this uh, and also saw it as a way to meet other requirements. Uh, C2C does fulfill 802.1X, your access switch, your port security requirements as well as a lot of other things that, that it can do. Um, so they were looking at this back in, I believe 2016 was the first time the Marine Corps dipped its foot in the water for this. Um, so it, it's been a long time coming uh, and it does coincide well with a lot of other infrastructure upgrades that we're doing. Um, I will say that it it is not as hard on the infrastructure as we might have expected. Um, we do have several sites. Uh, if you think about the recruiting stations that are out at the malls, you know, wherever you drive past them, you see them out in town. They're coming in sometimes over, you know, one and a half megabit links. So the smallest pipe that really you could buy nowadays, they're coming in over, I mean, a lot of latency, a lot of, you know, very, very cautious about what they deploy. Um, and I would say during our discovery, during our initial rollout, um, we had already had the system in place. We were already seeing their devices. Uh, we're able to start discovering things about them, start some basic interrogation. And then we you know, com com uh, completed a later stage brief and some of these folks at these sites said, hey, you're gonna blow me up. And we said, have you noticed anything? Because we've, we're already doing all this and you haven't noticed. Um, so they've seen less than a 1% increase on a one and a half megabit link. Um, so really it can be very lightweight. It just depends on how it's built and if you uh, uh, really uh, get to practice and get to build it out in the lab, you can see that. I don't know if that answered the question, but. Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir, it did. Um, and uh, I'm going to toss this one to Carmen from one of our uh, participants. Um, and I think, sir, you, you addressed it briefly. Is this going to give a pass on the 802.1x STIG requirements until C2C is fully deployed? Or are, are you guys looking to hold components to that requirement prior to C2C? So the next memo coming out from DOD CIO will hopefully be signed next week. And in that, it addresses directly um, what we intend to do about the 802.1x problem. How do we see, from a policy perspective, how we see 802.1x being applied? But we also know that for a large swath of our network where we are operating non-traditional devices, we know we can't get that 802.1x client or supplicant on those devices. So there's an expectation that there will be um, an interrogation um, and an implementation of a security policy-based part of the C2C framework that will ensure that the, that the non-traditional device is in the right place on the network is up to its latest potentially manufacturing um, configuration state. And then basically for the things that um, where we see devices, non-traditional devices in particular, that are not performing in the way that we expect them to perform, then uh, what we would then do is go into a quarantine action until a person can go and do the remediation. So. Um, I would ask your um, audience that if they are DOD, that the memo will be coming out and it does have a, a large part of the memo discussing how we're going to do 802.1x and when that is appropriate versus engaging into a security policy analysis and having that done through automation. Over. 
Thank you. That's a great answer. Uh, Kevin Tan, I saw you shaking your head during that. Do you have anything to add to that conversation from a component level? Yeah, total agreement on the complexity there. And I know that they're tracking that. Uh, we've, we've had this discussion uh, for probably two or three years. I know uh, Ms. Santos Logan was dealing with this one, you know, years ago already. So uh, they're tracking. Um, there, there, it, it, but really, there's only only a certain class of our devices are going to be able to do certificate authentication, which is the the 802.1x that everyone kind of refers to. Everybody else that we're looking at is going to have to do MAC address bypass at first. Now you can implement that with a lot of different tools, but with Comply to Connect, it's very you have full transparency of who's coming in via what method, um, and and whether they were allowed in via MAB and what MAC address specifically of theirs was allowed in. Um, you can see what device they, they came in through, what switch or what uh, wireless access point. So you really have a very good on-ramp into 802.1x. Uh, and to be clear, we haven't rolled out enterprise-wide 802.1x. That's my current battle uh, is to get away from sticky Mac to really come into compliance with the rest of the, uh, uh, the requirements uh, from the DOD. So we're, we're getting there. Uh, but this tool and the visibility into how devices get on is really going to be critical to being able to do this without knocking a bunch of people off or, or really scaring a lot of stakeholders away from it. Um, so um, really glad to have this thing out there and able to see that. Thank you. Uh, so Carmen, DOD is a large organization. Um, and what organizations are you expecting to be included in C2C? And are, are there any exempt organizations? Now you mentioned some more memos are coming out uh, later this week, next month. Um, can you address that for us, please? So the CIO is the DOD organization for, you know, digital modernization and other efforts, um, has the authority to direct the implementation um, primarily to all of the non-DOD intel components, meaning that uh, from, a, from a DOD information network or the DODEN, um, we are expecting to have Comply to Connect um, fully implemented on what is considered our unclassified or NIPRNET and certainly across our secret networks or SIPRNET. So the members that are part of either of those two networks that comprise the DODEN will be expected to deliver Comply to Connect. Over. Thank you. Ken Tan, from your, your experience of, of firsthand, um, you have people that are on the ground, IT service program managers that are implementing this, um, and they want to get, obviously, to where you are. Um, what advice can you give them if they haven't started or they just started down this path to get things moving? Well, it, it's become a lot easier with the DISA contract uh, it, uh, that basically provides licenses and the flex licensing. Um, what I would do if I was starting this from scratch, and this is kind of what we're doing at our MC, our community services network right now, is uh, find somebody smart, smart engineer who has some time. I know those guys don't generally have a lot of time, but set them kind of loose with 100 licenses in a lab. Let them start to play with it, build confidence. Um, at the same time, you can send them to the training, uh, the Four Scout Certified Administrator course that is also being provided via the DISA vehicle. Uh, that's really a great intro to how to set up um, a infrastructure from the ground up. Um, it doesn't really cover a lot of the stuff further down the line, further around the wheel, but that first first step is really in there. Um, so that's really the first thing that I would that I would recommend is 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 look at the phases, look at your lab environment or wherever you do your testing, and uh, set somebody loose, put something together, um, and, and kind of start to build it out there and build confidence in it. Thanks, sir. Um, we have another question from the, the group. Um, it kind of goes along the, the lines of implementation. I think you'd mentioned it briefly before about third-party integrations and the impact that you had seen on, on those tools, or maybe just in the lab or actually in the implementation. Right. Well, the third-party integrations are definitely where you really make your money uh, in the long term. Initially, just the discovery itself that this provides through talking to the switches and routers, and if you can collect traffic uh, doing that, you can really build a picture that people haven't seen before. Uh, and whenever I kind of show that picture, people are like, I, I want that right now. Uh, but really the long term uh, for this is that third party tool integration. Um, we have a couple of these in place now. Uh, they're not, I wouldn't say fully built out. And again, we're at year two and we're still kind of 
making, building our confidence in these because we do have established ways that we patch and that we vulnerability scan. All of that stuff already has established methods and reporting cadences. So uh, we, we kind of need to fit in where we can to, to start to build out the automation. Um, so really, again, coming up with some very limited individual use cases that we can safely do uh, and then working through uh, the deployment there. I'll name a couple of tools, uh, SCCM for, for your, obviously your Microsoft patch management, uh, ACAS, the tenable product uh, that, that it, we uh, report all of our numbers to the DOD, uh, HPSS, the McAfee product for uh, antivirus. Uh, we don't have, win we have Windows Defender in part, so some those that integration's there as well. Um, any of your SIM sort of tools that receive the common event format files, you can dump to dump it into there. We're doing a little bit of that. Um, and we've, we've experimented with some other things, um, mobile device managers uh, for, for phones and things like that. Uh, I can get into that. I don't want to take up too much time, but, but definitely the, the capability is there. Um, if it's not a built-in plugin that comes with uh, Forescout, and there's a pretty decent list. I think most of the common enterprise tools are in there, but if it's not, uh, you will have to build out something a bit more specific and tailored. Uh, there's a lot of different API methods that can that Forescout can support and use. So that's always an option as well. And again, for a smart engineer, um, I don't think it's that hard for them to, to put it together. Thank you, sir. Uh, the comment back to you, uh, you touched on it several times, but really, if you could dig into you know, the current funding that uh, the DOD has, and it was a contract with DISA, um, what you're expecting for future years, and once again, reiterate what the services or components are responsible for and what maybe they can get from, from DOD. So with respect to the licensing agreement that we have in place, um, it is the licenses, the latest um, capabilities and licensing from, uh, in this case, uh, for this conversation today, it'll be through um, the Four Scout. Um, the other parts and pieces are definitely the training, help desk, and integration. So with respect, so there is funding, because as I said, there's been enterprise provided funding for DISA to at least do the programmatic um, management of, of basically the Comply to Connect, as I consider it, as a service for the department for the next five years. Within that period of time, there will likely be a review, probably in leading up to 2024, whether we continue with Comply to Connect as the emerging framework um, as part of the zero trust effort, um, whether the tools and technologies that we currently have in our arsenal today from both um, enterprise owned and of course what the uh, components have made their investments in, um, whether the framework still makes sense um, because obviously technology changes, threats change, um, methodology, methodologies change, uh, but overall, the anticipation is that this is a joint relationship between what is provided by the enterprise and basically what investments the components uh, need to make um, based on you know their their roadmap. Um, but what we've tried to do is offset the burden of components having to go out and and buy their own sort of network based type tools and activities um, to to help them say look we. We're providing this as an enterprise uh, capability, and, and for all we know, it may end up being an enterprise service. Um, we've had talks about that, but where we have um, had, I won't say pushback, but there seems to be more interest in deploying Comply to Connect um, within each component as basically using, being able to reuse its own tools and technologies, and we're good with that. As long as they can achieve basically the, the three core Four or four things for Comply to Connect in terms of continuous endpoint discovery and be able to publish information about those endpoints, being able to either through the, the Forescout product use um, some of the orchestration and the APIs that Forescout provides, or potentially looking at a third party orchestrator as long as they can achieve um, the workflow automation necessary to to basically reduce the time and increase agility to uh, be able to respond to cyber vulnerabilities. And as long
long as they can provide the, the stream of continuous monitoring and continuous reporting, um, we see this as kind of a, a joint relationship between what's being offered in the enterprise and basically how the component interfaces um, with the capabilities that are being provided by the enterprise. Over. Uh, thank you. Um, with that said, there seems to be a, a pretty robust tool set out there for you guys to provide, but that's the technology side of the house. Uh, Kevin Tan, can, can you address the training of individuals? You have people coming in, coming out, PCS deployments, um, and, and people are a huge component of the success of, of this uh, program. Can you talk about how the Marine Corps is handling uh, that side of the house? But definitely. Uh, so we have sent, uh, we probably send two or three groups a year to the Force Scout Certified Administrator course. Uh, so that's the one week uh, industry certification. You have your test at the end, you get your plaque to put on your, your cubicle wall or whatever. That's great. And that is what we have put everybody through who is actually going to be uh, working with like kind of the nuts and bolts, if you will, of the system of doing the, the server onboarding, the management of itself of the, uh, the, the infrastructure for Comply to Connect. So whether it's those virtual machines, physical appliances, those people get to go to that course. Um, however, we've, we're working through kind of an abbreviated um, read-only kind of view course. Uh, Four Scout's been really supportive in helping us develop uh, basically a computer-based training course. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to share that in, uh, in the future. Uh, it's not ready yet, we're still working on that. But that would be a way to allow users to have read-only views. So if I'm a uh, tier one sort of help desk person and I wanna look up information about computers in a read-only way or see kind of what might be wrong with the system, um, I can do that. You know, I, I don't need that week's course. Um, I only need really a couple hours of introduction because the GUI, the, the user interface of, of Comply to Connect of Counteract is pretty straightforward, I would say. Any, any, any sysadmin who's been around and used other tools will probably be right at home on this. So um, I wouldn't push that one week course on people uh, who are just going to be looking there for certain reports or specific pieces of information. That really is something that we've done a very ad hoc uh, two hour screen share with to kind of explain, hey, this is the system, this is how you pull reports, this is how you get information, this is how you search. Um, so as far as the formal training is required, it, we, we don't really see a need for people with read only who can't blow anything up or disconnect devices and stuff like that. They don't need that exhaustive, you know, one week or one week plus kind of courses. So that's, that's kind of the route we're going right now. And as mentioned, we are working to formalize that with a, uh, a computer-based training uh, module. So we're still working through that. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question for you, sir, that just came in um, about how this applies to the endpoints located in the cloud environments. So um, really, uh, and the thing I've had to keep in mind uh, with this is IP routing is IP routing. So if something is routable and you can get a packet from, you know, wherever to the cloud or from one cloud to another, if it's routable, you can do the interrogation and you can do your logging in. It's really kind of a layer uh, it's, it's not really it's not really an issue as long as things can route. It, it does not do like layer seven application type stuff very well. So if, if you have applications that are hosted as a service, like Office 365, Salesforce, stuff like that, uh, probably not gonna give you a whole lot of insight into that. You can see whether those applications are running or whether certain ports are open on a device, but really it is looking more at the physical device itself. Um, so if you have, if you're treating your cloud kind of like you know, a big, uh, a big big VMware instance where you have kind of hosts in there that have IPs, you can do all kinds of things there. Um, and I know, I think I've heard from Forescout that they're working on a cloud appliance. I, we, we haven't deployed that. We're still trying to figure cloud out ourselves <laughs> as a Marine Corps. Um, but uh, if it's routable, it can get to it. And that's true really in general. Um, it, the way that it comes in will, will, will kind of make a difference for how much you can do and how you can whether you can shut it off or not. Um, but really, if IP routing is IP routing when it comes to this. Thank you. Um, Carbon, uh, just to, to go into the cybersecurity aspect of C2C, can you um, uh, kind of relate those two and what is the impact of C2C on cybersecurity? So when we first conceived of, of Comply to Connect as a strategy, 
we were looking for a methodology and a set of technologies that would help us resolve and hopefully put to bed the whole problem of why do we continue to operate at a state with poor cyber hygiene. So when this program was conceived probably back in 2014, there had already been ongoing efforts between uh, National Security Agency, a limited number of the combatant commands. There were some of the services that were all testing out how do we bring automation to, to kind of buy down the problem of, um, you know, cybersecurity and what improvements can we make with respect to managing the, the diversity of endpoints that are connected to the backbone. We also saw at the time that using our, basically the tools that are loaded on our endpoints can't see everything on the network. So we were operating as long as as long as we had agents on endpoints, we could we were safely, you know, we were in the belief that we had, you know, a fairly decent managed environment. But then we have, you know, all of the things that either operate us in the shadow, uh, things that we don't know that were connected to uh, basically uh, the backbone of the network. And then, of course, there's a there's the problem of of trying to do defensive cyber operations in the fact that you can't defend what you can't see. So if you don't have an understanding of what's on that network, then you've got poor network visibility. And that has been one of the probably longest festering problems that we've had in the department. And as our seniors continue to ask us, where are all our endpoints? How many do we have? What do they look like? You know, the whole notion of, of trying to get to an inventory from both a hardware and a software perspective was something that we could not deliver in response to basically those answers. But primarily we saw, we saw or see Comply to Connect as improving and automating some of the core foundational principles of cybersecurity, but there's also that whole aspect of reducing all of the the opportunities and and vectors that basically outsiders who who don't really you know who who aren't interested in how in how well you know we're we're able to defend they want to find those holes in our defenses, and so being able to understand consistently what our network looks like, where those devices are connected, and basically the security posture of those devices go a very long way toward improving basically how we do uh, cyber operations today. Over. Uh, thank you. I, I knew this one was coming. So um, all of us lately have been looking at the solar winds attack and how it's, uh, you know, you know, changing our thought process around uh, cyber and C2C. And Carmen, I'll, I'll start with you um, and what you can address. You know, what What are you guys looking at from that perspective? I mean, just in general to make sure that we can try not to have this happen again. I know it's a cat and mouse game between the defend and the attack, um, and we're always trying to, to stay one step ahead. Um, but if you if you could address that uh, quickly, and then Captain Tan, I'll get, get your input. So I think the solar winds event is an example of the, of the overall problem with respect to supply chain, right? So we've had situations in the past, probably, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago when we had concerns about um, Chinese enabled type products and capabilities on the network. And we, it took us weeks to be answered, to answer the question, have you found X product on the network? Do you know where this piece of software is? And so being able to become more agile with respect to things or, or events that the, the solar winds brings to the department, that particular event, we have to be able to be more responsive to the, to the consequences of um, operating tools and technologies that are not necessarily in the best interest of the Department of Defense, being able to find those very quickly because we have a good understanding of um, what we have on the network, what the software is that's on the network, um, and being able to pinpoint locations of where those things are 
and getting them off the network, um, you know, goes a long way toward toward helping us um, Im improve the overall defensive posture. Um, you know, for us, solar winds, uh, yes, there there were you know a lot of um, I guess I can say uh, a lot of concerns about how many of those type of things existed and how. I guess disposed or exposed um, DOD was to basically the the solar wind event, if you will. But we see that as one other example as to why we need the comply to connect because we really need to understand what is on our network, and we recognize that we can't answer that question through basically our our endpoint security tools today. Over. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Tan, uh, addressing cybersecurity, C2C, um, how, how they interact with each other, and, and then, you know, the solar wind side of the house, the question that we got from, from participants. Sir? Sure. Uh, I mean, there's, there's kind of a trite saying in the military uh, now with night vision and all the tools that we have, uh, you know, we own the night, right? Uh, which, which we can only do because we can see. Uh, so that that is what this really is trying to do for us is give us the way to see our environment, uh, to see near real time what's out there, what's connected, where, and who's doing what as you start to develop it. You can see that as well. So that's that's really fundamentally what this is, is, is you can see things. Now, the, the automated response, that's further down the line for us. We, we are trying to figure that out. But again, as I mentioned earlier, kind of find those single use cases, find some places where people are comfortable with automation and start to move that way. Uh, when it comes to the solar winds, uh, we were one of several tools that that just did a canvas. Hey, who's got solar winds? Where is it? Um, and what we were able to do was say, hey, it's this user. I can see who's logged into their workstation, who's got the solar winds SFTP server on their device or the Orion client. We can see that, uh, and uh, you know, I can say, oh, well, that's you know Sergeant Smith over in in, in uh, Korea. So you can send him an email because all of his Active Directory information populates there in the same page. Um, you could, and we could take a definitive action, do it, you know, right click, you know, uh, uh, apply, switch, uh, access control list, deny this, close these, any, any sort of things you could do, you could be more aggressive with it. To be clear, we were not there with that level of confidence. So we passed the information on and those who took action, took action. Um, but you, again, you have to be able to see these things, uh, and, and know. So even after sites have said, hey, we cleaned everything up, we're then able to do kind of an audit and say, okay, well, have you looked at this? Uh, that's that's where I'll leave it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Carmen, to go with, uh, I'm, I'm taking this from a DOD perspective. Uh, people in the DOD are looking uh, for documentation. Where can they get that on C2C? So if they're looking for the C2C strategy, We've issued um, a couple of documents. Um, we have uh, basically the 2018 memorandum um, that Mr. DC signed uh, that does identify some of the basic concepts for how we intend to deploy Comply to Connect. And as I stated, we believe next week the follow-on memo will be signed, and in that has the actual strategic implementation timeline and tasks and activities that um, we, we are directing or expecting components to carry out for us. Now, DISA as the program office is also responsible for developing and ensuring that technical implementation guidelines are developed. Um, they are going to start working at some point in FY21, um, the, the security policy library. So people that are ready to do things like interrogation and automated, um, starting to automate certain aspects of that C2C framework. Um, there's expectation that there will be common security policies that people will be able to leverage. But for right now, um, I think between the 2018 memorandum, uh, which is available at our uh, SharePoint site that has been made um, external to the uh, DOD CIO website, um, I can share that with folks who want to get a hold of me and can ask questions. We also have a Comply to Connect Tiger team that meets every, uh, was meeting uh, every week, but now we have gotten to the place 
where we are meeting um, on a monthly basis. And that allows us now to have a community share in exchange of where people are, what, what good things uh, people have done with their Comply to Connect implementations, and then allow for, you know, document sharing, briefing sharing, a whole bunch of information sharing that occurs at that level. But primarily, uh, I believe most people will, once they get a hold of the memo next week, that should answer a lot of folks' questions about how to get started, what's important, what does it mean to do uh, basically the, the first step of the Comply to Connect wheel. What am I going to do when I see all of these um, endpoints? Um, what do I do with the data that I'm collecting? So I believe that uh, memorandum will answer a lot of questions regarding implementation and next steps. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Tan, another question from the audience, um, kind of going down the operational path is, what's your understanding of the relationship of C2C and the Zero Trust? Uh, at least in, as far as my uh, mental framework is concerned, uh, C2C is an essential precursor to Zero Trust. Uh, you need to be able to assess, you need, you need to have a way to measure the trustability of an endpoint. Uh, and then, of course, you have your individual authentications that endpoint does to every system that it wants to touch. So we, we're not really totally involved in that, that uh, exact like user attempting to access this piece of data on this database. That's more Active Directory. That's different. That's Microsoft's problem for us, at least. Um, but that foundational awareness of, you know, trustability for that endpoint. What kind of endpoint is it? Does its Mac, have we seen that before? Uh, is it, does it have any weird ports open? Uh, is the user, is there an odd username? Like anything like that, we can start to kind of build some foundational trustability. Uh, does it have all the things it's supposed to have on it, right? And there are certain registry entries we look for. Uh, the, any sort of that basic trustability score, you have to establish that somewhere and you have to have some kind of information to make a decision about whether you can trust something or not. And I don't think the right answer is just to say, oh, look, credentials look fine, let them in. You need to have some more depth to that trust level that you're building. And Ed, I think what I would like to add to the conversation is that with, with, with respect to the DoD reference architecture for Zero Trust, Comply to Connect falls into the device management lane. Um, so in addition to the things that uh, Captain uh, Tan just described, um, there's an expectation that C2C as part of or enabling the device management part of that is one leg of the overall departmental strategy for the Zero Trust Initiative. Excellent. Thank both. Thanks to both of you. Um, as we get uh, close to the end of the hour here, um, Kevin Tan, I would like you to give your, your perspective on the enterprise C2C, any final thoughts uh, from anything. Um, I don't see any additional questions at this time. So if you can just give us an overview and, and, and uh, can help us wrap this thing up for today. Sure. Well, I'll say uh, a thank you, public thank you to Ms. Santos Logan, and then also to the folks at, at DISA who are not on right now for, for providing us uh, with the resources and the, the, the agreements and the foundational vehicle to do all this. So we're very appreciative of that. And I would say when I discuss the DISA vehicle, that contracts that Ms. Santos Logan was talking about as far as licenses and training, my leadership and my finance people all kind of looked at me and said, that's too good to be true. We don't buy it. Um, it, well, I'll say it is true. We're using it, um, so I, I really do rec push. You know, really do recommend everybody take advantage of that. If only just to get those first steps in a lab, just try it out, see what you think. Um, that's 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 kind of where I'll leave it uh, with that. But I do want to say a thank you to to the team over at DoD uh, CIO's office and and DISA as well. I know they're not here, but thank you. Uh, thanks, sir. We got one quick question that just dropped in was, uh, uh, has Forescout been used in the hunt and threat teams? Uh, so I, that's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> we have made a few accounts, but I have not, I'm compartmented kind of from uh, what, what exactly they're doing and, and, and how and all that. Um, but but uh, we have made them accounts. Um, so I'm sure that they're, they're doing something with it. All right, uh, so Carmen, I'll toss this one to you and uh, any final thoughts from you also. With, with respect to that question or just overall come apply to connect? 
well, the question on the hunt and threat teams uh, for Forescope. So we have not, here in CIO, we don't have evidence of that happening. We do have had, um, I guess, components telling us that they have used um, for Scout to go after indicators of compromise. And some of that was also proven out um, in some of the early pathfinding that was done um, by the different components. So um, I, I, I'm going to have to say yes, it, it has the, it, from what we've seen anecdotally, it appears to have the, the capability to do that. Now, whether people believe that that is the first product of choice, that I cannot, um, you know, I cannot say. Um, but I guess in, in kind of closing, you know, my, my concerns, at least my justifications that in conversations that I've had with my seniors as to why do we need a Comply to Connect and then basically how does it change, you know, how much of a um, game changer it is for the department. You know, we tend to talk about this whole notion of the, the, the national defense strategy of being more agile with respect to the Department of Defense and, and continuing to do what we have done without Comply to Connect and, and basically the problems that we have with understanding, uh, given the amount of data that all of our endpoints produce, trying to find out what the right problem is that we are attempting to solve, was one of the areas that I presented back to our seniors with respect to, wouldn't you like to have informed decision space? Wouldn't you like to be able to operate in an environment where you get rid of all that white noise associated with all of the different products that we have on the network, all producing information? And wouldn't you like to be able to have automation operating in the background so it is taking care of the tedious day-to-day -day stuff and really now getting to the point of, I guess, eliminating all of the different possibilities of um, avenues that we could go down to try and find out what is the actual problem that we're trying to solve. And wouldn't you like to be able to have automation reduce that whole problem state to just a limited number of, of places where there are truly problems that automation cannot take care of. So we're, we're I think at this juncture, back in 2014 and 20, through 2016, the whole notion of automation was something that when we would talk to our seniors about, they would basically say, I don't think the department's ready. Do I think the department's ready today? Yes, I believe, because we know we can't continue to not actively respond to basically the, the threats and vulnerabilities as, as they you know, show themselves on the network. We don't have days and weeks to respond to the threat. We only have basically minutes and seconds to a certain extent. And so having things like Comply to Connect operating, that gives us a better understanding of what that attack surface looks like, reduces in some cases the management of the different endpoint security tools, reducing the complexity because you've now automated its ability to execute. Those are game changers for the department and uh, you know shows a lot of promise as to where we're heading under the overall digital modernization strategy. And I think people should really get excited that we now have the ability to automate a lot of what we've done before, potentially take those people that we have employed doing the same thing over and over again, and being able to reuse and retrain them in such a way so that they can go do the harder cyber stuff, not do the things that configuration management, patch management, those things that have been eating up our time. So when we talk about, you know, why do we need it, I, I basically say, why not? And, and are we ready? And I think the department right now, because of all of the, you know, COVID is one thing, you know, outsourcing is another thing, I believe we are ready um, because the, the dynamic nature of cyber and, and defensive cyber and managing against cyber threat, those are only going to increase the threat. They're not going to go away. So why not? 
is kind of what I tell people when they start to push back on the notion of comply to connect. Am I going to say that we have the right strategy in place? I'm going to say for a certain population in the department, yes, we do. For those that have, you know, started to automate more, then we're asking them, tell us what you've learned so you can help us improve the overall expectation and the actual implementation so that a strategy, you know, is just that. It is, it's in that point of time, but it also has to be flexible enough to change. So we are really excited here in CIO to see the next steps kind of unfold and where the department can can go um, basically with these foundational concepts for Comply to Connect. Uh, Carmen, thank you. That was a great wrap up to what I think was a very, very great session. Uh, Sir Captain, Town, I want to thank you. I want to thank Government Exec uh, Media Group for uh, pushing this out uh, and for Scout for sponsoring this opportunity. Um, today, you know, was, was a starting point for information so that everyone can move forward with their C2C, their cybersecurity, um, and taking the next steps. So thank you, everybody. Um, this will be on demand shortly because uh, it was a recorded session, and have a great day.